Hi, um, so uh, I'm here with Andrew Hutchins, uh, and uh, Andrew's uh, very well known for creating uh, some games on the Archimedes computer, like Stunt Racer 2000, Starfighter 3000, um, and Chocks Away, to, to name a few. Um, he's had a, a brilliant career in computing, which continues today. And um, yeah, so Andrew, thanks very much for coming along and uh, coming and having a chat with us. Okay. Um, so, can we start at the beginning? Seems a good place to start. When, when was the first time uh, that you sort of remember computers? The, uh, what's your earliest memory of computers? Well, I suppose, obviously, the home games machines. Uh, when I was uh, growing up in the 70s, it was games like Pong uh, with the you know, bat and ball across the screen. Um, but in particular, the Atari uh, 2600 was my first experience of computers, even though it wasn't a programmable computer. It was a, a, a home games console by Atari. But that was, that was fascinating. Uh, I, Loved going to the shops, and back then you could you could ask at the counter in Boots. A ten-year-old boy would give you a copy of the game, and you'd spend all afternoon playing it until they shut the shop. And eventually, uh, we got one for home, and um, really fascinated by the sort of games that you could play on it. Uh, even though they were very simple, and you look at them now, and you think, well, how could that be entertaining? But um, they they were to me. Um, in particular, there was one called uh, Atari Adventure, and um, because it was effectively a very early open world game, albeit screens that you go left and right off, it, it was um, Grand Theft Auto of the time, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, and I think the fascination that I would have then would be the same that people experience now when they, they get the latest PS4 blockbuster game there's no difference in that um, amazement and it will be talked about at school and um, yeah, so the Atari 2600 home games console was my first experience of computers. Um, but my first real experience of a programmable computer was a, a ZX Spectrum um, because as soon as, as soon as they came out, they, I would have preferred to have a BBC Micro, of course, but um, we, we weren't the uh, rich family on the street. That was <laughs> further up the road. The BBC Micro, I seem to remember, was £400, and that was back in the, well, it must have been early 80s. Um, £400 is, I don't know, a couple of thousand nowadays, and uh, a Sinclair Spectrum was a, a mere £130, which was still an awful lot of money. Mm. Um, Luckily, I had a brother, and um, me and my brother would chip in together, so it would be Christmas and birthday money combined for two years to, to buy oh, a... So you, a you collectively saved up for this? So. Yes, we would collectively um, save up for a, a, a ZX Spectrum or a, an Atari console. We sold the Atari console just before kind of interest was lost in them, so we did, we did, did very well on that. I think, I seem to remember we sold it with a few games for about £100, which helped pay for the ZX Spectrum. Yeah, back then. Um, so yeah. yes, that was a lot of money again. Back yeah, then. So again, they still had their selling it in a newspaper article in the classified ads in the Evening Telegraph. <laughs> no internet then. Um, and um, yeah, we, we bought ourselves a, a, a ZX Spectrum. It, it took about three times. I think we had to take it back three times because they, just, they were so unreliable. Uh, the first one, I don't know, didn't work. Second one worked for a bit and then... Um, then broke and and finally we got a, a, a reliable one um, and it, that, that was um, where I first started to get an interest in programming not to the same extent as you know some of the people who've gone off to make giant companies now um, uh, I was more sort of dabbling with the the concept that you could, you could program basic so when you first switched on the um, ZX Spectrum it presents you with a screen and you can start typing um, and I got the idea that you could um, you could do simple programs quite easy, e easily. And I suppose the obvious one was a ten print your name or a, a, a rude word or something. Twenty go to ten. And once you learnt how to do this, you could have fun going into shops because <laughs> the shops like um, Woolworths and Debenhams would just have a, a, a spectrum on display with nothing running on it. It would just be there with the cursor blinking, waiting for some teenager or <laughs> to come along and uh, type in some program or another um, to 
print something on the screen and then we'd wander off and go and do it to another shop and then <laughs> someone would switch the machine off. And, um, but yes, I do remember learning enough programming to uh, go around different shops and make circles appear on the screen or print uh, things on the screen or uh, and I suppose at school it was the at school it was the Commodore PET um, yeah Commodore PET was the machine of choice there which I think was probably a, a state-of-the-art machine they were probably quite expensive mm. yeah and we would learn basic there and the, the basic was the the most common language and it was very very similar really uh, Commodore uh, basic and Sinclair Basic and BBC Basic. BBC Basic was definitely the stronger, uh, better language. There was you could do more with it. Um, but as I say, even even at school, they had two. I think it was two BBC Micros, and then a lot of Commodore Pets. Right. And it was really only the star pupils that got to sit at the back with the the BBC Micros, which could was do. That you? No, no, yeah. I was I was a, an average average <laughs> pupil. I think I, I could do I could do programming, but I never particularly excelled at it. I, I had enough interest to try and do some little games, but nothing nothing too bold. But one thing I did start doing on the on the ZX Spectrum was there were games like three um, D games, in particular on the BBC Micro. I knew a friend of mine had a BBC Micro, and. Um, I would see them playing um, Aviator on it, which was a, a right. wireframe flight simulator. Mm -hmm. And although all you had was a, a small, uh, you know, a, a, a rectangle or a few rectangles for a tower, um, for a cityscape, actually, I think it was um, three rectangles was the city. Um, <laughs> and there was a, a, some kind of suspension bridge, which was probably made of about 10 lines. And there was um, a, a road and a runway and so on. But it was fascinating that you could, uh, that was my first introduction to 3D in computing and that was something that probably uh, spurred me on to learn more about it and uh, uh, I do remember doing some very crude 3D graphics on the ZX Spectrum in, in BASIC this was. So it wasn't really you know, up to the performance wise but I could get an understanding of uh, describing scenes in 3D and um, drawing okay. lines between different perspective points and so on. So, um, so you say you're an average student, but you know you had a good understanding of 3D and, and yeah, 3D maths. Yeah, it was a lot of it was kind of self-taught. I would um, I would do it in my own uh, time, whereas at school I think they were probably wanting you to sort of do things that um, did a, a you know a a database yeah, of pupils' yeah. names and their average um, score in computing <laughs> or something. Yeah, this and didn't that, interest you? Well, not really, no. Yeah. I think with me it had to be something that was, uh, that you wanted to do, mm -hmm. not something that was just academic because it would probably make a good career path. <laughs> so for me, computing and the fascination was it, with it was the fact that you could do 3D graphics and um, and that's what uh, really kind of got me into it. Right. Um, but as I say, on the ZX Spectrum, I didn't, get, didn't go beyond uh, doing BASIC in, right. on that. And then eventually my ZX Spectrum broke down. I became okay. a sort of a later teenager. I, I started getting interested in other things, uh, cars or um, oh, um, yeah, model planes was my new hobby, right. radio, radio control planes. So I would... I would build and fly radio control planes, and so my my budget was spent on that <laughs> rather than computers, and and that's I, I suppose I kind of lost an interest in it. Um, I, at school, I was seen as more of an engineer. Um, it seemed that back in the eighties, every boy had to be an engineer, so <laughs> that was the um, kind of expectation for me. And I was quite good at uh, design and so on. Um, and so I focused more on that, and I think it clashed with computer studies. So I didn't do computer studies A level. I, I did design. Right. Didn't do particularly well at A levels. Um, well, I didn't get any A levels, <laughs> and decided to leave and get a job, um, and worked in various jobs. But I think after my once I got my first job, which was um, in the yeah, late mid-late 80s, I suppose. 
Um, I, I saw the, the Acorn Archimedes, and I knew a friend who had an Acorn Archimedes, and in the, in the day you, could, you still had computer shops that were independent ones, and they would have these uh, new machines running demos and so on. And they just looked so much more compelling to the, compared to the, the PCs of the time. A PC yeah. demo was like a, 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 a crude spreadsheet yeah. with columns and numbers in that you could edit, whereas a BBC <laughs> micro demo was uh, swirling colourful graphics, uh, you know, multicolour um, displays and so on. I remember seeing a, a Mandelbrot set being... Uh, it was just palette swapped, I later found out. Right, yeah. But before I knew that, it looked incredibly impressive because it was uh, all the colours were flowing through it. And I'm sure that was one of the early uh, demos that was on these demo discs that I suppose came with the Acorn machine. Mm -hmm. And it was that kind of thing. And I suppose I saw, must have seen, it would have been Zarch, the, uh, the Frontier, David. Yeah, David uh, yeah. yeah, so that was uh, an early demo um, and I think it was called Lander, yep. and that was that was unbelievable. That wasn't just lines; it was solid filled, uh, uh, flat shaded polygons mm. and a decent frame rate, albeit not that many. But that was that I had to have one of them. And so, even though my my job was working in an office as a office technician, sort of do anything kind of thing, but it was. Um, I, I, I had a job so I could get a loan. I got a loan and I bought an Archimedes. So you had to get a loan to buy an Archimedes? Yes. Do you remember was, how much it was? Thousand, it's over a thousand pounds. Yeah. And I think everyone thought I was mad. Why are you getting one of them? Why don't you buy a PC? Has it got a hard drive? And <laughs> all these questions were no. And I just want one. It does shiny things. Um, and that, and, and I bought it with the only intention of learning to program. It um, wasn't bothered about games and so on. Right. Well, I played games on it uh, and enjoyed that. So you are more of a, of a programmer than a gamer? You don't, you're not so interested in playing the games that you create? Um, that not cool? so much that I create, except for games, the... Yeah. I mean, no, I do play, do I play, do play games, a lot of, lot of games, oh. yeah. I play PS4 games right. now. Okay. Um, and on and off have always had an interest, right. but I remember so machine just at the time buying an Acorn Archimedes for the only reason was to learn how to program 3D graphics right. and and I just thought that was such an enjoyable thing to do and the machines have moved on so much since uh, as I say I had a break from doing it on the spectrum mm -hmm. and um, but that's a big move on from the spectrum yes so was it was it not daunting to, to just jump straight into 3D uh, graphics because I mean 3D for a lot of games designers you know took them out of the industry you know, when 3D come along, they just couldn't do it. They were used yeah. to 2D platformers and things that like that. That was the thing that always it's, interested that's what me. You, yeah, right? I think the 2D, I've never really got into the 2D games, right. but as soon as I realised you could do 3D, and I saw games like, uh, I suppose, yeah, Elite, of course, was yeah. one, but in particular on the Archimedes, it was things like the Lander demo. Mm. Um, and I also knew BBC Basic from uh, from school and from... Uh, other people who had BBC Micros. So I knew it was a really solid language to learn. It really, really, you know, it was very good. Mm, yeah, and you awesome. could, uh, you could just get straight in there. And I think on the, you know, as soon as I got the machine, I played some of the demos that it had with it. But in, in particular, started just writing tiny programs um, that would spin cubes around and then let you fly around the cubes and then I would buy the magazines and learn how to do assembly code, uh, copying bits of assembly code from there, bought a book on assembly code, learned how to do assembly code wow. and so within about two years of hobbying uh, in the evenings I was up to a standard where I could put together a, a reasonable game um, and that's how I really started my career. Um, I, I got a demo together, sent it to a company that were publishing Acorn Games at the time. They were called the Fourth Dimension, mm -hmm. um, and they um, they said they would advance me a royalty if I did this game for them, which later became Chocks Away. And I think I think at the time it was it was yeah written in assembly code. Um, so so this wasn't written in C compiled down to in, into machine code. This was C wasn't so much a no. thing at the time. So this was no. pure assembly language machine code. 
Yeah, mostly. I think yeah. you could, on the BBC, on the Acorn Archimedes, you could write a basic programme which would then switch into assembly code yeah. and then back into basic. Yeah. And that was really very powerful because you could just run a normal programme and it could just have core functions or core elements that were written in assembler. Um, and it was just a very... Uh, the assembly language with the assembly language on the BBC was really good as well. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the risk processor was ever so simple. It had uh, you know a, a, a few simple commands, but many combinations of yeah. them, and it all made perfect sense. There were no weird rules like oh this command only works if you have a eight bit register and a so the the PCs were just too they were too difficult mm -hmm. right. and it was just became a blocker for me. I, I wouldn't know where to start on a, a PC back then, but on a BBC Micro, I think because, or a, an Acorn Archimedes, yeah. because it was kind of founded from an educational point of view, it was set up to be something that you could get into. And it's, yeah. it's down to the, the risk processor, the, the, the yeah. ARM processor. I think the um, ARM processor made a big difference yeah. for me as well because it was such a well-structured, well-thought-out, um, way and you could really yeah you could really get a, a grip of it but also the things like the layout uh, I, I suppose I don't know whether this comes down to the the operating system but the layout of the screen was very logical mm -hmm. it was yeah, just, just the general you know, architecture the, the top left pixel was the first address and it went right to left all the way down to the bottom right pixel uh -huh. Uh -huh. and they were uh, you know if it was an eight color um, a, a 256 color mode, each pixel would be a byte, and, and then you could uh, store you could um, store memory onto that using the assembly commands. Um, and it, it, just, it just all made sense to me. Yeah. It was um, yeah. once you knew how to do it, and then as you uh, learned more, you could think of more ways of optimizing it. But it was um, it's fascinating because there's not much. It was not like back then you could buy a book how to write a 3D game in an <laughs> ARM assembler. So you kind of had to learn it all yourself. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you could from the magazines you could pick up uh, elements. Yeah, little snippets um, and blocks of code that gives yeah. you an idea. Yeah. Well, the first thing that had started me with, um, I was the first year or so I was always doing it um, in Basic, just uh, BBC Basic. But I saw a, a magazine uh, article which was about um, a line drawing routine that was written in assembly code. And I suppose that was, I copied that in, and uh, suddenly I could draw uh, five times as many lines as I could do in basic. Mm. And I understood enough about data to sort of construct some, um, the description of the lines so that the assembly um, line drawing routine could um, do them all quickly. And suddenly I was uh, getting some quite dramatically improved rendering. Um, and then I think I got a book, as I say, on assembly, uh, learned how to do it, and wrote my own kind of flat-shaded polygon routines, right. which weren't anywhere near as good as anyone else's, but they were one but my own. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you understood every part of them. Yeah. I mean, the important thing to, to say for people that are watching, I mean, the reason you drop to assembly language to do this stuff is speed, right? Yes. So if the basic runs a, a, a great, you know, a good speed, but if you really want to get the most out of the processor, you talk to it in the way it understands in yeah. the assembly language yeah. and, it, and everything works quicker. I mean, it's in, in games programming, programming now, it's not so much the case that you go into assembler, but mm. there's still many, many optimizations that you can do. Um, and I suppose shader language and so on is the new uh, way of uh, getting a, the rendering up to the type of thing that you want to do and optimizing and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think now you probably wouldn't tend to go into assembly mm -hmm. language uh, for writing a game, but you would use, there's, there's many, many clever tricks that you would use to get more uh, performance out of whatever uh, the game is. Because um, back then, you know, the trick was to make these machines that were actually quite simple, quite limited, yeah. do in things that were you know, seemingly beyond their capability. Um, and you know, the, the 80s and the 90s are full of games that you look at them and go, wow, you know, this yeah. simple machine could do that. You know, well, I suppose the yeah, basic language was the, the, the machine would have to interpret the language mm. and then convert that into uh, instructions, yeah. assembly instructions, ultimately. 
but it's the interpretation of it that back then was quite so, time yeah, consuming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I suppose also things like drawing a line, they would, they would create a routine that would draw a line in any of the different modes um, with any different colours and different options, whereas you would write an assembly line drawing routine that will only work in this mode, and it will only do, that you but it will be optimised yeah. for whatever your game wants to do. Mm -hmm. um, Fantastic. Yeah. So um, you mentioned uh, yeah, your first game. Uh, that was called? First game was called Chocks Away. Chocks Away. And that, was you... the, that was what I got uh, yeah, um, a contract to do right. from this company, The Fourth Dimension. And they gave you so, an advance uh, to, to get you to get that, create that game? Yeah, I think it was, it was fairly modest. It was something like £1,000. But at the time, I was earning £8,000 a year as a, right. an office technician I think was my job title uh -huh. but with I mean much to the horror of my parents because they thought I was you know my salary had gone up in the first year or so and I was doing fine in this company uh -huh. but uh, I yeah I was still at home and that was just what I wanted to do uh, it was so you quit it, the day job yeah absolutely and did it full time uh -huh. um, it was no hesitation whatsoever from my point of view that if I can make a career out of doing something that is so enjoyable mm -hmm. uh, compared to working in an office. <laughs> so did Fourth Dimension discover you? Did, did they contact you? Did they no, see the demo no, or did I, you go to them? I, I think they probably, I, I, I must have played their games, I must have bought their games. Right. And I think in every, back then it was you know a box much like a, 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 a sort of a video box. A video yeah. box. And they, they would put in inlay saying, you know, game programmer wanted, send us your demos oh, or right, something. Okay. So I think, those guys, I right? think yeah, uh -huh. they did rely on hobbyists like me. And I've, you know, I bump into the odd person who was a similar kind of working back then for the fourth dimension. Uh -huh. they're, they're in the games industry now, one or two people. Uh, I can't think of their names. I'll have to, I'll <laughs> but, have to check through our archive and see if we can yeah. find one of those things. I mean, make a great cutaway for this. Um, so, but, so they, they Advanced you a thousand pound? Did you did you yep. spend it wisely, or um, I, that, was I, a, that was a lot of money? You know, a thousand pound back in what was this? Nineteen? Uh, we were in nineteen ninety now, I right. think. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I say, yeah, left school late eighties, um, and then worked um, bits and bobs, but mm. mainly as an office uh, kind of um, person. Yeah. Um, after about two years, managed to yeah get um, this contract. Um, and so, so you had the machine though. So you, you, the, the hardware was sitting there. Yeah. You had the money. You just need to create this game. Yeah. Um, and it was was it the, the game was already under development. I assume you something you was the game playing was, for your own. Yeah. It, it, it was. It was a split screen. I, I remember this. It was yeah a split screen game where you could fly a, a small flat shaded polygon filled flat shaded um, aeroplane but you two people could fly them and um, they would you, you shoot each other and have yeah. a dogfight and that yeah. was all there was to it uh -huh. um, so I think it was a reflection of the fact that there weren't that many people like myself making these games mm. so that fourth dimension obviously thought it's worth the investment um, and I think they would set milestones so right. if I got to a certain stage they'd give me another 500 quid and so on and this was an advance on royalties so when the game was finally published it took about I think about a year to finish it right. and that was myself pretty much although they did uh, organize someone else to help with some of the graphics uh, Gordon Key I remember him yeah mm -hmm. He was quite a veteran in the Acorn Archimedes uh, games world. He, right. he got in there very early as well, so I think he, he did quite well out of it when there was less competition, um, and he was doing you know quite a few games a year. Uh, but he helped with some of the graphics for Chocks Away. My brother helped with some of the storylines. Uh, he did some of the uh, mission briefs and so right, on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and as I say, it took about a year to right. uh, write, um, and then it was published. I got a royalty of, I think it was £2.50 a copy okay. um, sold, if it was sold at a, above a certain threshold. Yeah. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was quite, it's quite good, and I think it did, it did pay off the advances. 
and I started uh, making quite good money out of it. Because uh -huh. I think at the time the Acorn Archimedes was still a fairly popular machine. Yeah. Um, I remember a, a friend of mine who I later worked with, Tim Parry, uh, he uh, had friends at university because he, he took the university route, so he was doing his degree whilst I was uh, uh, writing games. And I think uh, I'd sort of been heard of uh, uh -huh. through this game that I'd created uh -huh. and I think I seem to remember one of them had set it up so they they could play it across a serial link uh, oh, in their yeah. student digs uh -huh. and so on uh, so it was yeah it's all very uh, it's good so, yeah. so how did that feel to, to know your game was being bought by people and people were enjoying that game yeah it was, that was a fantastic feeling yeah uh -huh. um, I mean the first time that you have something out there I don't think they ever put it in shops but I can't remember. I don't it was think certainly plastered all over the magazines. Yeah, and like it was, I mean, that's it was I generally it. the magazines yeah. that you would you would discover stuff in. Archimedes World uh, and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Too, too I many remember the adverts. <laughs> yeah. um, it was, no, it was amazing. It was amazing to meet people who had known of your game yeah. um, and had played it. Uh, my wife uh, worked at a residential home for uh, children. Uh, and they were all playing um, Chocks Away in, their, uh, in the computer room. <laughs> and uh, I think my wife pointed out to one of the other members of staff that uh, her boyfriend uh, wrote that game. And, and they didn't believe her, no, um, as they if did. this was uh, impossible, yeah. that uh, you, you'd know anyone quite so famous. <laughs> um, and similar, when I met some of Tim's college friends, they would, they would say, oh, wow, yes, you wrote that game. Um, and it still happens, even um, some of the jobs that I, I mean, now I'm, I've been working in the games industry for 20 plus years, um, and I still go for games interviews, and I always put on my CV, wrote jocks away, right at the, right at the bottom, <laughs> after f five pages of stuff. <laughs> but some people do get there, and some people in the, in the UK games industry, especially, uh, uh -huh. um, were brought up on the Acorn Archimedes, and yeah. they, will, they will know that game, and they'll, they, they will say, oh, I, yeah, I used to play that. Um, it's incredible how often you get that. Um, I would say probably you know a third of the, my bosses in previous jobs have have heard of um, stuff that I did yeah. uh, 25 years ago. Uh, Fantastic. But yeah, incredibly proud at the time. Uh, great to get it out there. Brilliant. Yeah. So um, uh, don't need to go into the actual amounts, but when you talked about your your first uh, job, that sort of a salary of, of eight thousand pound a year. Um, at a certain point, you created your game. The royalties were coming in, and you knew you'd made the right decision. It was it was bringing in more money than the the, uh, the yeah. desk job would have done. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was that was the actual height of my desk job was eight thousand pounds a right. year. I think my first my first job was a, a double glazing salesman, and I think that was that was nothing <laughs> until you sold <laughs> something. Yeah, right. and I didn't sell anything. <laughs> Because um, it sounds crazy, because eight thousand pound a year the, now just sounds what? It's, it's nothing. But it was a it was back, a back then. It was yeah. I think they 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 did appreciate me at this uh, uh, place that I worked, mm -hmm. um, and but yeah, I think after um, after all the royalties started rolling in, and Chocks Away carried on for a long time, but it mm. must have exceeded twenty thousand right. um, pounds. I would have thought um, money, which was kind of unwisely spend, I suppose. <laughs> uh, I think with, with this... Tell me more. Uh, I, I suppose, uh, you know, perhaps uh, when I was um, yeah, um, 18 or so, I was spending more time as a, a computer programmer and not going out so much. Mm -hmm. And I guess once I had a bit of money and uh, uh, found new friends and so on, started going out and enjoying myself and going on holidays and and uh, buying a car um, and, and stuff like that. So I guess uh, I, I did a sequel to Chocks Away and that went quite well. Uh, that was Chocks Away Extra Missions, yep. imaginatively titled. That as well. <laughs> um, and that, that also did quite well. Uh -huh. But then I suppose my, uh, I just, yeah, my creativity dried up and uh, I was due to be writing another game called uh, Spitfire Fury, uh, which the Fourth Dimension were keen on, and they were backing me again. Uh, but I, I guess I let them down in that it's, um, I 
was enjoying myself too much and right. um, uh, lost uh, lost interest a little bit. It, yeah. I suppose uh, you're doing the same thing again, um, and it's also you're doing it on your own, so you have to be quite disciplined. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. once the uh, initial and this was you know after about three years of doing it, mm. so uh, I guess the um, the money ran out. Uh, I even got my credit cards taken off me oh, right, okay. <laughs> by the bank and had to be uh, bailed out by my uh, wife. <laughs> and um, no, but no. so th there's there's quite a few rock and roll kind of lifestyles that come out of everybody that was creating games at the time. It's uh, you know. <laughs> people that are uh, earning money they didn't expect to be earning and then uh, yeah, go to yeah. head a bit. <laughs> it does, uh, yeah, I, I think I just uh, squandered all that money as soon as I got it, whereas before I think, um, and I suppose also because, you know, whilst um, people were perhaps going out when they're 18, maybe I was um, staying in and yeah. computer programming and so I missed out on a bit of uh, living it up time. Um, but then you made then, up for that. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> made up for that later but um, so, so you needed to get another game created then to make some money again yes well it was all what, what looking like to? it was going to be all over except for the fact that there was um, a friend a long-term friend from when primary school called Tim Parry and he'd always uh, he, he'd gone to do his degree at Leeds University and he's doing very well could have gone into a, a good career but instead chose to um, work with me. And this was after I'd sort of had my um, shoot to fame and then do nothing <laughs> phase. <laughs> and even so, he, he was still you know, keen to give making games a try. And um, we agreed to have a, an equal business partnership where we would try and make games together um, and share the responsibility and, mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, the earnings from it. Mm -hmm. um, so within, uh, as soon as he'd finished um, his degree, his first thing was to work with myself. And this, we didn't have offices, we were working in our parent, uh, parents' house. Yeah. Um, it was me and Tim in my bedroom <laughs> uh, with two Archimedes and we wrote a game called um, Stunt Race uh, 2000. 2000 yeah. And we put it together really quickly because Tim knew a lot of stuff that, you know, you perhaps wouldn't discover yourself, right. like, you know, how to do a link list and so on, and just structuring things a lot better. And so instantly, uh, the, I would say the quality and the editing tools as well, Tim could do, um, he, he realised that, you know, instead of big sheets of graph paper with numbers scribbled on them, Let's write a, an editing tool where you can put down sections of racetrack and so on. Um, so he introduced a lot of uh, good uh, techniques that mm. I wouldn't have done myself. Right. So instantly we were able to churn out something of a, I would say, a much more complex and higher quality uh, than I was doing on my own. Um, and I went back, to, we, we asked the fourth dimension who were pretty fed up with me at this time because I think they'd, they'd spent some money on the graphics for Spitfire Fury. I think they'd probably advanced me some, advanced me money, but yeah. I think they, they did recoup it right. out of the chocks away royalties, which had suddenly stopped. <laughs> um, and they, they sort of forgave me and, uh, and, and, and took on this game, um, Stunt Racer 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and we, in less than a year, because we're, as I say, with the two of us making it, we would make it for ourselves as well. So we would make a game that we wanted to play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the first things we did very early on was get a serial link going so we could play um, a, a, a competitive game between the two computers right. sat next to each other. And we'd also do a split screen version as well. Um, but we would have great fun just um, messing around, knocking each other off huge towers in these cars and, and coming up with ideas for the game. Um, it was kind of loosely based around, uh, there was a game in the arcades called Hard Driving. Yeah. And so I think that was probably our inspiration mm -hmm. for Stunt Racer. I think there's also one called Stunt Car Racer on the uh, Amiga, mm -hmm. uh, but the Amiga was not quite as good as the Acorn in terms of power. Um, as I say, yeah, we put the game together in um, 
le less than a year. Right. But it was, the, I think the market had dried up in selling, on, in sales, so it was, there was now two of us uh, trying to eke a living out of it, and mm. there was considerably less uh, money um, coming in. And it wasn't, for some reason, it wasn't a, such a big hit. Um, I think when I broke the Chocks Away game, it was something that had a, a certain appeal, whereas it seemed that Stunt Racer struggled a little bit. We did um, an extra, um, extra mission, not extra missions, extra tracks disc. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't think it made anywhere near as much money as Chocks Away had done. No. I think it was because it was shared between us as well. Yeah. I think we were down into the uh, less than 10,000 each probably. Right. Um, but was it more I, enjoyable experience working with somebody else? Oh, God, yeah. No, yeah. it was great fun. Yeah, yeah. We, we, I mean, we had really good fun right. making it. Um, and it wasn't, it, it, went, it went fairly, very smoothly, really, uh -huh. uh, saying it was the first time we'd worked together. Um, we yeah got the game out there but I think we it was then the subsequent game that um, we decided to do again on the Acorn Archimedes um, and that, that was called Starfight uh, 3000, 3000 yeah. and uh, we decided to go out you know put all our effort into this yeah. uh, it's going to be the biggest and shiniest and best game ever to come out on the Archimedes um, and we had big ambitions for it and we really, you know, did everything to make it as uh, spectacular as you could. Um, and I think it took, it took um, 18 months to make in total. Um, also, we decided rather than going through a publisher, we decided we would publish it ourselves. So um, we would, because publishing back then was really just a case of getting the thing in a box and contacting the magazines with um, an advert and um, it, it's yeah. not as yeah probably not as complicated as a publisher is these days mm. uh, and I suppose in such a small market the acorn market there's there's two magazines two distributors and um, once you know who they are <laughs> that's um, um, so we, we had a go at doing this um, right. we were making the um, the instructions and getting them photocopied at Tim's dad's work and, right. And getting Tim's mum to staple them all together for us. Did Tim's dad's work know about this? Uh, um, yeah, well, he owned the company, so I think he was fine. <laughs> um, okay. And we had some uh, CD boxes and inlays made. Um, back then, I, I remember making the artwork for the box, which was actually, we'd photograph the screen, mm -hmm. and then we'd get small prints of the photographs and cut them out and stick them on bits of cardboard and we, we would take this to the, the printers who would then um, somehow digitise it or yeah. however photograph and, and, it yeah, and, and make uh, prints. Right. It was not yeah, not like you would nowadays where it's all done a nice thing in Photoshop. Yeah, or something. it's like a desktop publisher and people yeah. don't think about a lot of the production yeah. of those games from the early days. Um, it's like the magazines and things. Um, one of the things that people point out was oh they're typing a, a, a game from a magazine uh, and it never worked. It'd always be errors in it. And actually, if you think about the process that happened there, those games weren't um, sort of sent in digitally. They were yeah. usually written by some kid, fairly young, written out on a piece of paper and sent into the magazine. Then somebody in the office at the magazine would have to then type it out so it could be <laughs> yeah. put into the magazine. They didn't have desktop publishing, so you know it, it just got sort of, again, photographed and put onto the, the magazine. The, the amount of chances of error in that were enormous, and therefore, yeah, they hardly ever did work. Um, mm. But then that's what creative programmers, right? You know, those yeah. people that typed them in and worked out why they didn't work, they become the programmers. But mm. it, was a, it was a very different time, you know, the, the way that, like, say, the, the covers of your game was produced. It wasn't desktop published, it was... It yeah, was no, it and was... Um, and we, uh, we had some friends helping us as well. There mm -hmm. was uh, an artist, uh, there was two artists, uh, uh, Todd and Chris uh, helped us. Um, but again, it was, yeah, the, the, um, as the, the computer artwork was, obviously you would do that on the computer, yeah. but for things like the, the cover art um, for the disc, or I think the magazine, uh, James, Tim's, Tim's younger brother, James, was into uh, publish art on the okay, uh, yeah. Acorn Archimedes, and he knew advanced stuff like putting four pictures into an advert <laughs> so I think he he actually helped us put together the adverts uh, 
that went to the magazines, which mm. were probably a single file. But I do remember the box. The box art was just like you would sort of do as a, a, a primary school kid, just sti <laughs> sticking uh, photos Prick onto a, a sheet. Um, <laughs> And in terms of yeah production, we just had a, a bank of as many computers as we could get, and we would just uh, copy the discs manually, putting stickers on them and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, the game took an enormous amount of effort to get it finished, and was very ambitious and very much left to the last minute. Um, when we did release it, it had quite a few bugs in it because we were programming it until the 11th hour. In fact, I, I do seem to remember it was, we released it at the Acorn World Show mm. and uh, we were working on it until the day before. Um, and then at some point, I think Tim decided, because he was driving there, so he had to get some sleep and I had to stay up all night with a, a bank of computers and uh, a load of blank discs. And just duplicating just, this. Just copying the discs, <laughs> putting the stickers on. I think it was two discs um, a two disc game, each disc probably took, I don't know, a couple of minutes, minutes to so. duplicate. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So you're sitting there completely <laughs> exhausted, swapping discs in and out, putting stickers on them. And I'm sure must many people must have had blank discs I'm or sure I'm two disc twos and so on. Um, and we did, uh, we offered a free upgrade of the game once right. we, after we released it at the show. We did really well at the show. I think um, we, we had a, a small stand that was, uh, it wasn't even our stand, it was Tim's younger brother who was into, James, who was into publish art. We, I don't know, must have paid him or persuaded him somehow to have a small corner of right. his desk that he'd um, booked at the Acorn so, World so the, Show. So the, the Acorn World Show, I didn't even know you were coming, it was just kind of um, snuck in? Yeah, as, I, think, as... I think we must have made it public in magazines <laughs> and so right. on. Um, but yes, we were, uh, we were publishing on a, the side of a desk. Um, and um, back then people used to give you cash yeah. um, and checks. So we'd have a, a giant box full of cash. Um, and uh, I'm sure it was yeah, into the thousands, many, many thousands in a, a few days. And I think it was Just probably- Just show. Yeah, because it was almost every few minutes someone was giving us and incredibly, it's twenty-five pounds. We could back then. We seemed to be able to charge a similar amount for a game that you can now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. In fact, more. In I yeah. think if you take into account inflation. Well, in real terms, yeah, twenty-five pounds in ninety-four is probably sixty pounds now. Sixty, seventy so quid. Yeah. It, quite an impressive um, thing, and obviously because that was that was uh, direct cash going to us. I mean, obviously when we sold it to. Some of the distributors, they would only pay us 50% yeah, yeah. of its retail price. Mm. Um, but at the show, we were getting uh, 100%. Wow. And uh, we had a big, big box full of cash that we were having a money fight with at the hotel <laughs> afterwards. Um, and I, I seem to remember our parents um, yeah, giving my dad a, a bundle of cash to take back on the train and, uh, and so on. Amazing. Uh, yeah. A money fight. Who won the money fight? <laughs> Um, I think probably the people who cleaned the room afterwards and found all those and <laughs> rolled up the pillows. What's going on? <laughs> Amazing story. Amazing. And um, the thing that worked out really well for us was that um, I mean, we did we, the game did quite well, but for saying it was eighteen months' work and two of us, it wouldn't have we wouldn't have carried on except for the fact that there was a, a another publisher. A, a more professional one, this one's um, actually a, a games developer called Chrysalis. Right. And uh, their boss, uh, Tony Kavanagh, had spotted us because Chrysalis were doing some um, conversions of Amiga games onto the Acorn Archimedes. So it was you know, slim pickings to be made here, but if you right. could do a, a, a good conversion in a small amount of time, you're know, getting things like Lemmings onto the Acorn Archimedes. Mm -hmm. the, the sort of games that the um, the original developers wouldn't bother converting because the Acorn Archimedes didn't really have enough of a market. market yeah. But yeah. he was doing that and was obviously, because of that, by chance, aware of the Acorn uh, magazines and saw our uh, demo on that and got in touch with us and right. said, um, oh, we'd love you to develop this game onto the, um, it was the, 3DO console, right. and yeah. um, 
and other consoles that were coming out. I think it was only the 3DO at the time, though. Um, and he said, uh, you know, he will give us a, a very generous royalty. It was a 25% royalty of sales um, if we came up and developed the game um, in his offices in, in Rotherham. Mm -hmm. So he, he gave me and Tim an office. Um, uh, we had some uh, support. They had a professional musician do some um, sound effects and um, some music for the game. Right. Uh, there was a, a render artist who did um, a, a, a movie kind of intro, mm -hmm. uh, pre-rendered yeah, intro FMV, for the game, so yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and a graphic artist who uh, did some of the texturing work for the game. And we took a lot of the ideas that we did on the Acorn um, Archimedes version, we took them, converted them, um, but also kind of wrote it for the um, 3DO console. Right. Um, so did you actually do the, the code for the, the 3DO? You had to yes. learn? The well, the 3DO, luckily, was an ARM processor. Right. Uh, so we were able to uh, suddenly do more ARM assembly code. Well, was, was that luckily? Or did he approach you because he knew that they were, the porting this across might not be as um, difficult as it would look? I think he, he just took a, yeah, um, took a bit of a punt on us, I right. suppose. Uh, but he did invest, you know, I think we were getting uh, advances on our royalties. And I think also it was, a, it was at a time when uh, other companies, big companies like Philips and so on, were sort of dipping their toe in the water with video games. Yeah, so there was there's quite a lot of um, money from the big companies who were looking for developers. Mm -hmm. And so I think Tony was very good at the business side and mm -hmm. he obviously must have um, known you know, which shows to go to and how to uh, present. But, but he, did, did he know technically that um, porting from the Archimedes ARM-based to the 3DO, also ARM-based, would have been relatively straightforward? Because he could have said you'd put it on some other completely different platform that would have been a nightmare. I don't, yeah, I don't know, right. really. I don't think that was the main reason. I think, I, well, so I like to think, I like to think he saw an opportunity for a great game to come out um, and that was just the particular games console of the time. Because this was before the PS1 had come yeah. out, although there must have been dev kits around. Mm. Um, and no one really knew what would happen. I mean, as it happened, the 3DO console was you know, yeah. a bit you know, um, of a note in history. Yeah. But um, it could well have been um, the next PlayStation. But yeah, I think... Uh, yeah, PlayStation and um, Sony and Sega stole the show, mm. and I think are largely down to things like they they did Ridge Racer, and then suddenly you could play it on your home telly, and it looked not far off no, the arcade good, yeah. one. Absolutely. And similarly, uh, Sega uh, with uh, Sega Rally, and they they just had these amazing games. 3DO console struggled a little bit with frame rate and processing um, power. Um, but it, it, it made us, yeah, we, we made a, a tremendous amount of money out of that. Right. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, a, a really hard work yeah. working away in Rotherham. Mm -hmm. uh, it took us about a year to do. Um, we even had a, a proper producer, an American chap from the, I think he must have been from the 3DO company. Because mm -hmm. 3DO were the primary, uh, I suppose, the first platform to, for it to go out on yeah. and then it was agreed that it would be later converted onto the other platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, manufacturers. Yeah and that was the conversion the conversion of the 3DO version was taken over by uh, Chrysalis. They did all of that um, which um, yeah brought in uh, yeah a very large amount of money in a very wow. short amount of time. Wow. Um, but but again an enjoyable projects? Hard work, um, but fun I think it's it, very, was... it must have been a very different feeling for you because you've gone from the bedroom to you know offices at uh, uh, a, a, a production company. I think um, it was less enjoyable right. because we had just we just worked really hard on this one game and then we just went somewhere that's away from home and had to work really hard again. Right. Um, Without yeah. a break, right? Without a break, with, and a quick, with a quick money fight, and then uh, then obviously, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, nevertheless, yeah, it was it was good fun. But I f do seem to remember it was just continuous work and 
and uh, yeah, I think we it was very very tiring. Yeah, um, no, sounds like it. And then it was after after that we were kind of um, left to do our. We'd agreed a contract with Chrysalis to do uh, free games, um, the first of which was the conversion of Starfighter, and then I think the hope was that we would convert some others or come up with other ideas that we'd then use on our subsequent games. Mm -hmm. um, we went away from Chrysalis and started working in our home village on uh, a Sega uh, Saturn game, uh, which was going to be kind of like Stunt Racer. Um, and we had various different ideas, but um, I think we lost, yeah, we lost the momentum and lost direction, I think, mainly. Right. And just came up with something that wasn't very impressive. Right. Uh, and Chrysalis ended up saying, uh, you know, it's not going to work out. Yeah. And they dropped us after, I think, about probably nearly a year of development. Right. Uh, but to be fair, we had, you know, we didn't have a very good plan mm, um, mm. and we hadn't come up with anything that was that impressive so by then. But the rate of change was so quick as well. As soon as, yeah. you know, as soon as the new platforms came out, suddenly it wasn't teams of two, it was teams of ten, yeah. um, which was, you know, Psygnosis and Wipeout and so on. They were coming out with some, you know, really uh, polished looking games yeah. that you just can't compete can't with. Compete with it, no, um, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's somebody said to me, um, and I don't, and this has probably come from somewhere else. So I apologise if we're stealing this <laughs> this line from somewhere else, um, to whoever that might be. Um, but you're kind of the, like the last bedroom programmer. Is that something you've heard? Uh, yeah, Is that, that you'd was agree with? I think um, Magnus. Uh, oh, Magnus Anderson's book. Anderson's right. Okay. Book right. Okay. That makes sense. That. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know about that. But certainly, we were sort of doing doing it as kind of the bedroom code as when everyone else was starting to form companies yeah. and so on. Uh -huh. But we weren't, I suppose, we weren't that kind of business inclined. We, we did it mainly because it was a hobby um, that suddenly started paying, uh, paying well. Um, and I suppose maybe that was perhaps our downfall, but then I don't know whether if we had, there must be so many people who turned into businesses and then never got heard of or again. Or joined other teams yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. No, you don't, I mean, you can't regret anything in life, can you, once it's done, no, it's done. I wouldn't, it? yeah, so I wouldn't the, know if, uh, certainly I mean, we, there certainly are bedroom programmes even now d d developing games, but the point is that, that I think, to me, at that time, the time that you were creating games, there were lots and lots of 2D people, game designers, that were taken out by, by the whole 3D revolution yeah. um, around the 3D on the PlayStation. Um, but because you were already doing 3D, you kind I of had much we lasted longer longevity. because yeah, um, we were doing. We, I mean, there was a probably a moment where yeah, we were you know uh, sitting there with you know other companies, but they just developed um, um, and grew their team sizes and in, extended their quality so much more than um, we could have done. Yeah, I mean, you um, resources. Yeah. And I think a lot can change in just a, a matter of years. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think if I was if I was fortunate enough to have just been into the Acorn Archimedes two or three years earlier, when it first came out, mm -hmm. then it, it could well have been slightly different because I would have developed a, a career. It, it, a lot of it's luck, mm. really. Absolutely. Um, it's what you do with that luck. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, so you, you saw... Uh, David Braben's Zarch yeah. came around the game, um, and that got you into the the Archimedes. Um, do you regret seeing that game and not seeing something else, maybe that was on the Commodore Amiga or one mm. of the bigger platforms, Atari ST or whatever? Because I mean, I, I'm I was uh, an Archimedes uh, person, so I've got a lot of love for it. But ultimately, things like the the uh, Amiga and the Atari ST were selling in bigger numbers um, and and had greater sales on games and things. Not regret sort of going down those routes. Um, yeah, I mean it would have been uh, good in some ways. Um, I think probably breaking free of the Archimedes onto a PC at an earlier stage would have would have perhaps allowed us to carry on being um, more independent. Um, but I, I think the barriers to getting into the PC. I did actually own a PC. Mm. Um, I think with some of the chocks away money, I decided to buy a, a 386, I right. believe, 
which in spec and everything was a lot better than the Archimedes, but um, you just couldn't, there was no switch it on, enter basic, start programming. You could, I think there was quick basic, which yeah. you could do, and then there well, was a, the, a big mystery of out. what assemblers to use and what um, C compilers to use and so mm. on. Mm. And it was just an awful lot to learn. Uh, Different and graphics I think cards and all that would have, Yeah, that would have created a barrier, a mm. technical barrier to, uh, to entry. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have stopped, it would have disencouraged me potentially. So I think, uh, I mean, I never learned assembly language on the uh, spectrum because it wasn't very uh, easy. Mm. Um, and I did learn it on the, um, the uh, Acorn Archimedes, yeah, because mm. it, was, it was a really good environment mm -hmm. to learn in. And I think if it's something that's difficult, then you lose interest and then you don't end up um, getting anywhere with it. Mm. I've never been one for really digging into the technical stuff. I just want to see the results. Yeah, quickly. Until you can see the results, the, you see the results, and that's the feedback that gives you the inspiration to try and do more. Mm -hmm. If you spend ages, and then it feels like you've you know, walked through treacle to get your one pixel on the screen, you just go, oh. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we use BBC Micros today with kids that teach them how to program because it's immediate. You know, you type in a couple of line of codes, type run, and it does what you just told it to do. Yeah. Um, and it's really important. Um, so that's, that's why we still use them here at the museum. Um, you, you, and you're talking there about um, sort of the creativity, I suppose, of programming. So it's got to happen quickly because that's where the creativity comes in. You need yeah, that. Yeah, I that. think you need that the, the, to see something. Well, certainly for myself, yeah. you, need to, you need to imagine what you want to do, um, do something that you imagine is how it would work mm -hmm. and then see the results mm -hmm. and I think if you if that's too too time consuming yeah. then there's a uh, certainly I would probably have I think if I had a um, bought a PC back instead of uh, or a, or even an Amiga or something I would have probably found it more difficult to get into and possibly would have just lost interest yeah, in it because um, people mm -hmm. have said oh yeah you shame you didn't um, get a, an Amiga, well, possibly, but then on the other hand, um, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly has given me a, a, a career in mm. games and it started me into a career in games without having to go to university. Um, so effectively, it was my university um, course instead of um, actually going somewhere. Yeah, university of life. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so out of the games that, that we've talked about so far, which one are you you're most proud of? Do you think? I, I guess. I mean, obviously, it has to be the one that's most successful, which is Starfighter, uh, and also because it was just such a uh, you know labour of labour of love. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, they were all they fond memories of doing all of them, mm -hmm. and I think the the other thing is, I suppose, you know, probably the first game as well, Chocks Away, because it's very much your own thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas now you, um, I, I work in teams of you know fifty, hundred people, and you're just doing a very small part. Mm. Uh, you can look at the finished product and be proud still, mm. but it's not something that you can totally yeah. um, take any this. kind of. Yeah, you can say I did a very small bit on the. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are you doing today? Tell us about uh, what you're up to at the moment. Uh, my current, uh, I'm. I, contractor, but uh, I'm currently full-time at a company called Slightly Mad Studios, and they uh, do a, a game called Project Cars, uh, which has been a big success, and they're now working on a sequel, uh, and they're also working on other games, um, and I've been working with them since Christmas. Um, my specialist field is audio programming. Um, okay. I kind of ended up in audio programming through... Um, after uh, me and Tim um, disbanded, after Chris Liss dropped us, I, I ended up working at a local company called Eurocom uh, Games, and they um, they did a lot of uh, work for hire, kind of doing license games for Disney and so on. Right. So they they were a very uh, professional, uh, well-funded company, 
and I worked there probably for the longest time that I've worked anywhere about seven years mm -hmm. uh, I worked at this company um, but at some point during that um, I, I was taken on as a generalist kind of gameplay programmer uh, but there was a lot of late nights and a lot of um, it was before they had producers and schedules and so on, so it was very ad hoc. Yeah, a bit rough and, and tumble. A little yeah. bit, yeah, a little bit stressful. And so I said, oh, is there any you know, work in the tools department where it can be a bit more consistent? Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to have a career, not, yeah. uh, not to sort of give up uh, every single night. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they said, oh, we've got a, a role in audio. We thought about having a centralised audio tech. Uh, we need an audio programmer, um, and that's how I got into that. Um, and it's you know it's it's got it's got its challenges, um, and you uh, eventually you learn all the different um, systems and techniques. Yeah, of, I was going to say uh, it's very different from three D programming. Yes, no, it, well it's it, it's a career really. Uh -huh. It's it's not. I suppose ultimately I would love to be um, you know on my own writing flight sims and so on. But I suspect I probably would run out of money uh, because it's a very, own. very mm. difficult thing to do nowadays. Yeah. So I suppose audio programming is a, a, a career. I right. suppose the same as uh, an accountant might not necessarily dream of <laughs> being an accountant. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I've got a great interest in audio. So, um, so actually, it's sounding quite interesting to me. So what is audio programming? Uh, audio programming is a, a range of things. A lot of it is organising large chunks of data and getting into the game. We often use uh, middleware, which is uh, someone else will have created an audio system, so you have to understand that, how to integrate it. Um, and I suppose also hooking up to the game, and mm -hmm. um, the game will uh, have audio triggers and you will need to uh, connect them up to audio systems that can be uh, generated. Um, I, I suppose that I, the, the techniques of making the audio. I don't actually make audio. No. That's there's a, an, an audio uh, designer. Yeah. Um, so you connect who will, that audio to the game at the right time. Yeah. So I suppose oh. I'm uh, an audio programmer. Generally, is helping the audio designers implement the audio into the game wow. by hooking it into the different systems using whatever middleware they decide to use or sometimes their own systems. Um, I'll but, take it we're not talking about 8-bit mono samples anymore either. We're now talking about 5.1 mm. sort yes. of sound and, and, and soundscapes and layers and... Yeah, there's quite a lot, sound of, quite a lot of complexity of mm. and there's, there's, it is very satisfying yeah. still uh, because there is something where uh, it's that, that same thing where you, you imagine how you could do something, then you, you try and implement it, and then you have the reward of it working and mm. being successfully implemented. The, the, um, the thing is, because you can't see it, you don't, you don't appreciate what it is, but if you take a film or a TV programme or whatever and you take the sound away from it, it's half it's gone. You, you, it introduces the drama and everything to the, to the film yeah. in the same way that sound in games is going to introduce the feeling and the depth of the game. Yeah, so. no, it's a, it's, it's a very, it's, it is an art form and yeah. it's very, it's very subtle, the sort of getting it just right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's, uh, yeah. I mean, I think with graphics as well, I think the graphics um, now is, there's so, so many very clever people who want to do um, 3D graphics. There's a lot of competition there. Um, and I suppose audio programming it's less less of a popular choice so um, in a way it's it's always been a good career move for right. me I've uh, generally found um, some you know very good jobs since I've been doing it I think I've, I mean I've worked for companies like uh, Disney and Sega right. and Microsoft um, doing audio programming because uh, once you once you get good at something you've got a good good record behind mm. you um, it's um, it's quite a skill, um, right. and yeah, definitely interesting stuff. And and uh, some of some of the things is some, sometimes you do get to do the more interesting side of signal processing and so on, where right. you're actually um, creating systems to mix audio together and analyze different elements, analyze frequencies and so on. Right. So it can get quite technical sometimes. So in but the then, uh, Fourier transforms and all this kind of stuff? Yeah, or, yeah right, okay. I've done that, those sort of things to analyse uh, car engine sounds. It's my specialist specialist skill. Right. So 
uh, because I worked at Sega, Sega Racing Studio doing Sega Rally Revo um, and uh, met some of the guys who worked at Codemasters mm -hmm. um, and they have a you know strong tradition in high quality uh, car engine sounds and so I learned, uh, learned about it from there, worked at mm. a Disney run studio, Black Rock, who were doing another car game, a racing game called Split Second. Oh, Split Second. Um, and so I learned some more about car audio there. Uh -huh. um, and now that's uh, helped me f secure my current job at uh, Slightly Mad Studios as um, working with their, um, you know, Project Cars. It's um, car audio, so. <laughs> um, and that, there, there is, yeah, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff you can do yeah, uh, just to make the environment sound good and, yeah. to, uh, and to make the, yeah. Um, so I suppose when, like, so if a car goes through a tunnel, it, it, does the sound change or do you put effects on that, that sound to make it yeah, you, like, you reverb would generally, and Yeah, you would generally put effects on it. Uh, and but that's you, your domain, is it? That's that how you control the trigger that says, right, you're now entering the tunnel, start implementing yeah, the effect. Yeah. It's, uh, the effect is called uh, reverb, which yeah. is a fairly common effect. Um, it, it's generally taken care of either by the, uh, the software um, SDK kit will have reverb functions or the right. middleware. So it's kind of not as uh, clever as you might well, think. Well. It's almost switch on reverb. Right. But uh, the, way you, you, the way you go about it and some of the tricks that you can use to get things sounding as good as possible whilst keeping it uh, CPU and channel voice right. usage optimized, it can be. Yeah, because I'd uh, imagine you kind of get pushed to the side on CPU usage. You know, we we want all yeah. that for the, the <laughs> It's not so bad when a new console comes right. out until later on. <laughs> so when, when at the moment, dressing out all at the, the moment, cores. everyone's got lots of uh, <laughs> performance and right. memory. But yeah, another two or three years, and the graphics people will need it for their shiny stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. That's uh, been really interesting. Thank you very much for your time. Um, not bad for a lad that didn't go to university. Um, <laughs> that's not an advert. Make sure you go to university, kids. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, but no, thank you very much for your time. It's been really interesting. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Cheers.